I, I guess the hopeful message is that uh, that people have more control than they often think they do. Uh, not maybe not so much um, over what happens to them, but how they respond to it. Okay, welcome to the Become Your Own Therapist podcast, the podcast where I try to put myself out of a job as a clinical psychologist. Today, we have uh, James E. Maddox, PhD. He is a university professor emeritus in the Department of Psychology and senior scholar at the Center for the Advancement of Wellbeing at George Mason University. He's the former editor of the Journal of Social and Clinical Psychology and former director of the Clinical Psychology Doctoral Program at George Mason University. He's a co-editor of Social Psychological Foundations of Clinical Psychology and co-editor of Psychopathology, Foundations for Contemporary Understanding. And he's the editor of Subjective Wellbeing and Life Satisfaction. Maddox is a fellow of the American Psychological Association's Divisions of General, Clinical, and Health Psychology and a fellow of the Association for Psychological Science. His recent activities have included international travel that has involved giving lectures, teaching graduate students, and organizing workshops on evidence-based clinical interventions, primarily in the former communistic bloc countries of Eastern Europe. Uh, Dr. Maddox, thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure. I'm very happy to be here. Okay, great. So I, I first came across your work uh, when I was reading um, the the life satisfaction um, and well being textbook, um, and uh, I, I looked you up a bit and saw some of your work on improving well being and and your passion for you know helping increase well being in the world. And I thought you know who, who better to have on the podcast than someone who is passionate about this work and has done science in this area. So just to give you. Some some context you know that's why I, I wanted to have you on um, so this this podcast is is geared toward you know helping people become their own therapists and I think well-being is extremely central to that I know you've done work on mental health in general as well so I think maybe we could start with a, a broad question uh, okay. which is I've noticed Lots of terms, especially in, in positive psychology, terms like happiness, terms like well-being, terms like life satisfaction. So I, th I think those are maybe three of the major ones I hear. Just just for the lay audience that's listening in and, and wondering, you know, what's well-being versus life satisfaction versus happiness? Um, how would you help them differentiate those things? It's really not that complicated. Um, usually, uh, for example, the, uh, the standard measure of, uh, of what in English is called happiness, and we need to keep in mind that um, uh, languages don't always translate directly from one to the other. So what we call happiness in English, uh, a word in another language may have a slightly different meaning. So we'll be talking primarily about the research done uh, in using the English language, which means primarily research in the United States and in the UK and Canada and Australia um, mm -hmm. and in South Africa, where English is the primary language. Uh, so we're limiting ourselves a little bit culturally, but uh, that's true of any research in psychology. So I think that usually the, the, the typical, the, the, the standard measure for what we call in English happiness is the uh, what's called the uh, um, two-part measure developed by Ed Diener, uh, who passed away sadly several months mm -hmm. ago, um, which involves asking people how they feel emotionally about their lives, whether they feel good most of the time or a good deal of the time, and whether they are satisfied with the conditions of their life. And being satisfied is a little bit more of a cognitive and intellectual evaluation versus an emotional evaluation. So we have both the emotional component of how I feel, whether I feel happy, pleased, pleasant versus disgruntled versus angry versus uh, anxious or sad. And whether when I step back and look at my life, I, I believe that my life conditions are favorable. What's interesting is the um, the new UN report on world happiness um, just came out. Uh, they do this every year. 
And the measure they use is uh, a measure, I've forgotten the exact name of it, um, but they ask people uh, basically on a scale of one to 10 to rate the conditions of their life uh, in unfavorable or favorable, meaning mm -hmm. are, there, are the conditions of my life conducive to uh, having a good life? Now, what's interesting is that is largely a measure of life satisfaction. It's very, it's, it's asking me, do I believe that, that the conditions of in my life, my life conditions are favorable? They don't ask people how they feel about those life conditions. So it's possible to say, yes, I have everything that anybody could want in life, yet I'm still not satisfied. Mm -hmm. So there is some difference in asking pe people whether they are satisfied with their life conditions, which is a little more intellectual, versus how they feel day to day in their lives. However, most of the research shows that, that measures of those two constructs are fairly highly correlating, meaning in layperson's terms, if you, if you say, yes, the conditions of my life are objectively favorable, you're also likely to say, yes, and I, am, I feel pretty good about my life. So that basically is um, how we tend to measure happiness and life satisfaction. I think it's also important to make a distinction between um, life satisfaction uh, and happiness uh, versus uh, what economists call uh, quality of life or standard of living. Standard of living is an objective economic measure, usually in terms of um, per capita gross domestic product, meaning taking whatever a country produces and dividing by the number of people, and it shows you how wealthy that country is compared to other countries. So that is considered by economists a, a, a an objective measure of a country's well-being. However, we also know from research that a lot of countries with, with very high uh, economic standards um, are people are less happy than a lot of countries that are much poor. So economic measures can be seen as a proxy for well-being, but they're not very good because of the, of the great variety among countries uh, uh, with a certain standard of living and their life happiness. The Japanese, for example, have one of the highest standards of living economically in the world. The Japanese tend to be um, not particularly happy compared to uh, the Nigerians and probably the South Africans and, uh, and other countries that are uh, less affluent economically. So that distinction is important, too. But in the well-being literature, we're concerned with the psychological aspect of how I feel about and what I believe about my life, as opposed to objectively what my life consists of and what my living conditions are objectively. Mm -hmm. OK, great. Thanks. That's, that's all very useful. Uh, why? What got you interested in, in well-being and, and got you passionate about, you know, advancing well-being? That's a great question. I, my degree is in clinical psychology, but when uh, I was a graduate student, I became interested in social psychology, which is concerned with um, more or less um, everyday life, um, as opposed to clinical psychological problems and mental health problems. So I early on began blending the two together, never really in my mind made a distinction between mm. so-called clinical disorders such as yeah. depression and anxiety uh, and, sim and simple and, and everyday problems in living that people uh, encounter on a day-to-day -day basis. I always saw the clinical problems as just exaggerated forms of the kinds of emotional issues people deal with every day. And so mm. when you're looking at social psychology, you're really more concerned with the idea of well-being uh, and enhancing it as opposed to the clinical psychological notion of curing or treating mental illnesses. So I've always tended to blend the two and I've always moved back and forth between those two areas. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to remember, it may have been when I, when I read um, over 20 years ago, the uh, American psychologist article by, um, uh, I can never pronounce his name, Csikszentmihalyi, and who also died recently, unfortunately, and Martin Seligman. 
in which they laid out the, you know, I call it the positive psychology manifesto, saying that psychologists should be concerned more than with fixing what's wrong with people and what's wrong with society, but also helping people to enhance the quality of their lives and enhance their sense of well-being beyond just being okay and beyond just being not depressed and not anxious. So that, I think, probably sparked uh, something in me, too. I also... Very early on in my, as a graduate student, ran across the work of Albert Bandura, who also unfortunately passed away recently at the age of 94 and 95, mm -hmm. and began doing research on his self-efficacy theory, which again is concerned with, um, not with curing psychological problems, although it's been used to study uh, psychotherapy, but concerned with uh, helping people achieve goals, help understanding motivation, understanding what drives people, understanding how people can, uh, uh, can organize their behaviors in ways that help them achieve what they want to achieve. So all those things are, I think, really related to, uh, to well-being. And I tend to be kind of an intellectual gadfly. So I, I start reading something. I want to read more about it. And in fact, the, um, the book came about as an invitation from the editor of the series uh, uh, to do something on well-being. And I wanted to do something on the social psychological aspects of, of mm. well-being. Uh, so it's been a wide-ranging um, wide adventure. Journey. Yeah. And it sounds like uh, your contribution really came from that being, being that gadfly and, and being in, in different sort of spaces and, and seeing value in the, the bridges. I, I, I hope, I think so. And I hope so. It's, that's always been fun for me. I, I've been lucky in that the uh, George Mason University, when I joined there, was a young, small university and they allowed me to do what I wanted to do. And I wasn't required to focus on one particular thing and do it over and over and over and over again, which some people are good at and they they and, and they contribute a lot doing doing focusing on one aspect, but I was given I was allowed to move here and move there and do this and do a little bit of this and without me a chance to begin. I think what gives it gives you the chance to see how things are connected and related, which I think is another way of making a contribution is seeing how what's being done over here and over here and over here are actually kind of the same thing or have very, very much in common in the same way that if you look at um, uh, um, uh, uh, research on psychotherapy, particularly cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, and then research on what are called well-being interventions, they are really using the same basic principles and the same strategies with slightly different goals, but um, they're really not that different. But I've, I've gotten to where um, I'm not sure I even like the term positive psychology anymore because it suggests that positive psychology is somehow disconnected from something called negative psychology. And but it's all it's all connected. It's all related. It's a, it's a matter of emphasis and focus as opposed to a difference between a difference between two really different approaches to psychology. So I look for connections as opposed to diversions. Yeah, I, I resonate so much with that because I started this podcast because it seemed that disconnect seemed to be there as though people who struggle clinically or the, or the techniques that are being used in the therapist's office, as though those are an entirely different set of phenomena or events that go on mm -hmm. rather than tapping into human processes and and uh, you know into our biology and evolved you know tendencies I, oh, totally agree which, which i think is what um social psychology i think has a lot to offer uh, so-called clinical psychology uh because mm -hmm. the assumption is that uh people uh, go through uh, problems on a daily basis. And mm -hmm. the principles that explain everyday problems in living, which are the principles of social psychology, uh, can also be used to explain uh, so-called clinical problems and clinical interventions. So, again, you know, I'd, like, I'd like to look for connections. Mm. 
Yeah, and and I I don't like that that idea that you know there, there's this uh, discrete disorder in in somebody and and they need a specific kind of person or specific kind of procedure to, to cure it. Just that that overgeneralization of a a latent disease model or like a medical model onto just just human processes that lie on on spectrums of of suffering. Yeah. And I, I think you I'm feel the same. How, how how you arrived at that position because typical i don't know much about uh, clinical psychology training in south africa mm. but i know that there were several south african psychologists uh, decades ago who made major contributions uh clinical psychology uh, internationally uh, mm. i'm thinking of um oh my gosh uh the cognitive behavioral therapist from 40 or 50 years ago jo joseph Volp, volpe or volpe yes yes, yes. volpe and one or two others uh so yeah. I, I know very little about psychology training in south africa so i'm curious as to what how your training led you to the position that you take now, because that's not a traditional, <laughs> typical clinical psychologist viewpoint. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely not. Um, and I, I actually don't attribute it to my training because my, my training is very much in the, I think the disease uh, model, um, you yeah, know, the DSM, uh, yours as well. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, for, so for me, it was. Um, I, I think I've I've always tried to to help myself in in many ways, and I've always been interested in in you know other forms of healing, uh, meditation, uh, self help, and mm -hmm. and uh, you know I, I think when you are in the psychological space, the clinical psychological, you know, the serious, mm -hmm. discrete mental disorder space versus trying to help mm -hmm. yourself on a daily basis, I I think mm -hmm. you can't help but notice the overlap on that. Uh, in those two yeah, spheres. Absolutely. Once, once you take your head out of the, um, the idea that there are discrete categories of people, discrete categories of disorders, if there's a discrete line between problems in living and clinical disorders, once you abandon that template, uh, the, the, the entire world changes. Mm. It really yeah. does. Yes, I'm, I'm. I'm loving this validation from the, you know, to actually hear someone uh, agree with this because it's. I, I do find it rare in terms of training and and the mainstream views. I'm. I'm glad to hear you say that, and I. I, I want to actually get into that. I, I want to dig into that in terms of problems of living and and well-being um, over over the years that you know you're in retirement now, but you've done a lot of work. You've published a lot um, in in this field and. Are, are you, how convinced are you that people can improve their own well-being if they take that project seriously and have the right knowledge and tools? I am very confident. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking. <laughs> I wouldn't have bothered to edit that book if I believe that people could make significant changes. Now, it's, change is not easy. That's a cliche, but it's not. Mm -hmm. And change takes time. It takes effort. It takes a strategy. It takes a plan. Sometimes it takes uh, professional assistance in order to mm -hmm. develop a plan that actually works and a plan, hopefully, that is based on uh, some, uh, some bit of science that says that this plan may help you achieve what you want to achieve in your life uh, emotionally or professionally or educationally. Uh, so, um, mm -hmm. and again, depending on the problem the person is trying to resolve, uh, there are problems that are easier to resolve than others, but I firmly believe that people can make uh, significant changes in their lives. Okay, great. So I, w I want to, um, I want to start with a, well, I want to give you a broad, broad question because I want to see where you go with this uh, because you you have so much experience and you've written about many different, you know, aspects of well-being and, and positive psychology. So what are the areas um, or what are the things that, that really, you know, time and time again, through your own research, through reading the literature has shown you that well-being the, doing this or, or this sort of behavior or this way of thinking or, or this event 
really interacts with well-being at a you know uh, in a in a strong way so what are some of the things that have a strong relationship to well-being that is a big question <laughs> yeah, and uh, it's hard to know where to start because basically every chapter in that book that i edited has mm. points to something different and important and it probably depends on i, I think that uh, there is no single formula for enhancing well-being that applies to all people. Everyone is different. And so the recipe, I think mm. that the basic set of ingredients uh, might be this could be useful for everyone, mm -hmm. but different combinations of those ingredients uh, would, would, would be different for different people. So you have a lot of ingredients, but, very, but a lot of different recipes that can be created from those ingredients. Uh, some of the ones that have been shown by research time and time again to be uh, well-being enhancing, um, and some of these go back to uh, uh, cliches and sayings that, uh, that, that you know, your grandparents would say to you. Um, for example, count your blessings. There's a lot of research that gratitude uh, is a very powerful well-being enhancer. Gratitude toward the feeling and expressing gratitude toward people who have been helpful to you uh, in your life and on a daily basis. Even saying thank you to someone who has done you a small favor is a way of expressing gratitude and those small acts of gratitude are well-being enhancing um, along the same lines uh, research shows that uh, sitting down maybe twice a week two, two or three times a week and making a list of the things in your life that are going well things that you can be grateful for you're not expressing gratitude to any particular person but you're expressing you but you are uh, um, taking inventory of the things in your life that are going well which is important because it, it's so easy to get stuck into thinking about what is not going well or as well as you would like that it's it's difficult sometimes to stop and think okay well this is not perfect but gee this, you know this is this part over here and this is going pretty well so so gratitude for the things in your life that are going well um, there is a concept in social psychology uh, called social comparison that is related here and there's a distinct made between um, upward social comparison and downward social comparison. And in upward social comparison, you, which is basically what Facebook is all about, <laughs> in upward social comparison, you are comparing your life to people that you think have lives that are better than yours. If they have more money, bigger cars, bigger houses, take fancier vacations, they spend their summers, you know, on the beach in France and they go, you know, skydiving and skiing and all those things that people post on Facebook. When you look at that and say, gee, they're having so much fun. What's wrong with my life? You are engaging in upward social comparison. And that is definitely not good for well-being. On the other hand, downward social comparison is the process whereby you examine your life and compare it to people whose lives don't seem to be going as well. And you say to yourself, and, and then there's the, there's, the, uh, for, there's the phrase, you know, uh, there for the grace of God go I. That's saying, you know, that's this, I am so much better off than these people over here. And that's a so that's a well-being enhancing strategy. So mm -hmm. gratitude broadly defined um, is a well-being enhancing strategy. Another one along the same lines, and I recently wrote, wrote a brief article about this for the um, website of the Center for the Advancement of Well-Being. In fact, there was a, there's a book that came out several years ago, uh, is uh, uh, Small Acts of Kindness, simply being nice to people on a daily basis. If you if you are in the supermarket and you've got a basket full of groceries that'll take 15 minutes for the checker to check out, and the person behind you has a six pack of beer, and you turn around and say, "Would you like to go ahead of me?" That's a small act of 
kindness. What the research shows is that not only makes that person feel good about you and about life and about the world, but it also helps you feel good about yourself. So acts of kindness are well-being enhancers in in these two ways. And if they enhance the well-being of the recipient and they enhance the well-being of the bestower. And there are probably a hundred times every day that we could stop and say, you know, what, what can I do? To, what, what act of kindness could I engage in in this particular situation? So kindness is important. Um, mm -hmm. Where to go next? Um, Can I just ask a question, a follow up on, on one of those before we play with some other ideas here? Um, the the, uh, the gratitude, um, I've found myself uh, wanting to to start something like that, uh, a gratitude journal versus, you know, just uh, maybe a list or just sitting down and taking stock in my mind mentally ab about it. Uh, where, where do you, is there any place you'd recommend for someone who is thinking about getting started with some sort of gratitude practice? It's, it's very simple. You sit, you sit down and make a list of the things that are going well in your life. I mean, I, I, okay. maybe, you can, maybe, maybe you have a, a partner or a friend who could help you. If you're having trouble generating things that are going well, have someone that you are close to who knows you well to say, well, well hey, uh, you know, this is going pretty well. You, want to, you forgot about that. It's, oh, yeah, I forgot. That's actually you know, going pretty well for me. So <laughs> it, it's not complicated. You just sit down and make a list, you know, maybe five or ten minutes. Or start it one day and jot a few things down. The next day, jot a few more things down. I'm, I started making a list maybe some 20 years ago. And it's the same list, basically. And, and every few weeks or months or so, I'll take it out and look at it as a reminder of myself of things that are going well. Mm -hmm. Particularly when I get this corner about something that's not working well, I pull the list out and go, like, okay, so here. Let's, let's, let's get some perspective here. All these things are going well in your life. This thing is not, you know, this, this one little thing temporarily is, uh, is a pain in the ass, but uh, in perspective, with life going pretty well. So it's not complicated. However, it is important. They've done a research that shows that doing this too much actually can become a burden, that they had people who would do it twice a week, which is four times, three to four or five times a week, like every day, that ah, this, is, this is way too much work and basically making for the worse. So you need, to, you need to find the right balance of the time you spend with your uh, with your gratitude list. But make a list and add to it along, you know, a few days or a few weeks and then take it out and look at it every now and then. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I, I, I might be uh, overcomplicating this. And it, it's, uh, I, I was wondering Psycholo just... Psycholo psychologists do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that uh, agreed. Yeah, I, I see that within myself. And um, I, I have uh, just a clarification there about uh, it, it, the, the magic of, of making this list. Is the magic in uh, writing down the list or is it, is it necessary to sort of uh, meditate on that a bit, give it some attention, stay there for a moment? First of all, let's take the word magic out of that. There, okay. is, there is no magic. There's nothing <laughs> magical about any of this. Um, okay. But I think there, there is benefit to be gained from uh, making the list, uh, mm. which is not to think. And then there's uh, um, pondering the list and then reviewing the list and revising the list. So it's not a it's not a one it's not a one shot deal mm. where okay. I'm going to make this gratitude list, and that's going to make me happy for the rest of my life. I'll have it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an ongoing yeah. process in the way that staying physically fit is an ongoing process. Or you don't mm. brush your teeth once and then say, well, I'm done with that for the rest of my life. That's all the <laughs> data there I need. Uh, so sure. the gratitude list is it's the process. Okay. And, and I think what the list does, making a list and reviewing it, also it's in your head the idea that okay, um, it's very easy to dwell on what's not on what's not going well, mm. and so let's let me stop and think about what 
is on my list of things that are going well. Mm-hmm. You're stuck in traffic and you find yourself, you know, you know I got this damn commute twice a day. Uh, you can say, well, oh, at least I've got a job that I enjoy that pays the bills. So there's yes. ways of reminding yourself, even in, in down and dark and disgruntled moments, that this particular event in the grand scheme of things is, even though it's currently a pain in the ass, um, it's just currently a pain in the ass, as opposed to it's not my entire life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, have you ever uh, have have you seen in the literature, maybe in your own experience uh, as a clinician, uh, people uh, using gratitude uh, as a form of emotional avoidance? Emotional avoidance. Uh, we need to explain that yeah. that how that works. So, um, have you ever heard the term? Uh, it's quite a buzzword at the moment: toxic positivity. No. No. Okay. So the, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of buzz about people who um, always have to show the impression of being in a good space, and and I'm you know I'm I'm happy, I'm positive, or no, that didn't that didn't bother me, or that. Uh, so so constant, you know, using the the positive things in their life as mm-hmm. as. A, a way to almost not acknowledge any difficult emotions or any difficult experiences within them. Is uh, that, yeah, uh, I understand the concept, um, uh, and I don't research on this. Um, mm. I guess the question is toxic to whom? Um, <laughs> we often find those people annoying because. <laughs> In the back of our minds, know that it's like it's like the Facebook people. Everything, everything is yes. everything, the puppies and roses, and uh, you know, drinking beer on the beach all the time. And you know that's not mm. true. So that's that's mm. kind of toxic, maybe. Right? Yeah. It's, if it's toxic to the person who is engaging in it, um, I suppose anything, any strategy for making yourself feel better can be used to the extreme where it leads to you avoiding dealing with real mm. issues. Uh, so mm. I would say in general, any basically anything can become toxic, uh, meaning counterproductive uh, or even destructive if used to an extreme. Mm. Uh, ex- ex- exercise, it's possible to exercise too much to where you damage mm. your body. Um, so there's yes. uh, everything... Every strategy, psychologically and physically and medically, can probably be used to the, to the extreme where it becomes uh, damaging or counterproductive. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Yeah, I think that's a useful uh, analogy of the, the exercise. Uh, I think that makes it quite concrete how this, the, this in excess can become uh, counterproductive to, to yeah. the end. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to... Um, hear where else your mind was going before we so we've got gratitude um, acts of kindness what what else comes to mind for you um um i i think um well of course there's there's physical health and there's decades of research research showing that um exercise of almost any kind is a uh, is a is a well-being enhancing strategy so that, that, that's uh, a given that if you are feeling good physically, you're more likely to feel good psychologically. And, and that exercise is a, is, is a stress reliever. It helps uh, relieve um, uh, depression and anxiety and anger. Uh, so I think daily exercise of any kind um, uh, can, be, uh, can be useful. There's good research on the use of meditation. Uh, I, I have a meditation app that I play every morning, and it's 10 minutes, which is about all I can do. That's, that's about as long as I can sit still. Uh, so it's, it's perfect for me. Mm-hmm. And it's a way of developing the habit of living in the moment, I think. Mm-hmm. And 
a, a way to learn to get your head out when you find yourself worrying about something you did five years ago and how could I have been so stupid to have said this thing to this person versus worrying about what you might have what might happen tomorrow or problem that it helps you focus on the here and now and what is right in front of you including in particular the person who was right in front of you who deserves your attention which is why um cell phones make me crazy because people that you're having a conversation with the phone rings they go right mm. to it um and forget that there's a person that they are communicating with which is why i turned my phone off before we started this podcast so that i wouldn't hear okay. it ringing in the background uh yes so 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 exercise being physically fit uh, meditation we all know that that sleep is very important uh um and I don't know how, how big a problem sleep deprivation is in South Africa, but, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but, but the United States is a kind of a workaholic culture. And so uh, the vast majority of people complain about not getting enough sleep. Mm -hmm. So that's something we've known for, for decades and decades. One of my particular interests is in um, money and materialism. And his relation to well-being and the research mm -hmm. here is really complicated and very very interesting because the connections are very complex uh for example the research shows that for individuals and for nations that there is a positive correlation between economic affluence and well-being or life satisfaction. Hmm. But there is a point, not quite a point, but there is a level at which that correlation becomes less and less powerful. For nations, that tends to be the point where um, the vast majority of citizens' basic needs are being met. Basic needs uh, meaning uh, people are getting enough food. They have clean water, they have shelter, uh, they have accessible health care, um, uh, they have basically stable, predictable governments, their lives are predictable. Um, mm -hmm. Beyond that, uh, increases in, we'll say, in uh, per capita GDP, the economic measure of well-being, uh, those increases do tend to increase uh, national well-being, but the relationship becomes smaller and smaller. That, uh, and, and again, again, as I said before, comparing uh, several countries with um, relatively high uh, economic affluence, uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, come to mind, uh, comparing them to countries that are less affluent, uh, say this is Nigeria, uh, Brazil, um, Mexico, countries that are rel relatively poor compared to those two countries, have generally uh, a higher per capita sense of psychological well-being than the richer mm -hmm. countries. So it's a, it's a very um, tenuous connection. We also mm -hmm. find from research that the same applies to people, that higher income is related to uh, increases in life satisfaction and increases in subjective well-being, but it starts to level off. As uh, at once once you've bought your, I guess once you've bought your, your your third TV, your fifth TV, then buying the sixth TV may make you a little bit happier, but not as happy as you got when you bought your first television. Or buying your third car makes you a little bit happier, maybe at least for a while, um, but then not as happy as getting as buying your first car. Maybe the same thing with, with the size of your home and your one hundredth pair of shoes. Um, so, so, so increases in income still give you a happiness bump, but it becomes less and less. That's complicated by the research on what you do with the money you make, how you spend your money. Okay. And there's a lot of research that shows that uh, there's, there's a... Uh, 
There's a term uh, from an economist back in the 1890s, I've forgotten his name, but the term is conspicuous consumption, meaning consuming and buying stuff in order to conspicuously in order to impress other people. Hmm. So the reason you are going taking a vacation to France is not because you care about French culture or you care about going to the Louvre and seeing great works of art or because you want to taste authentic French food. It's only because you want to be able to take selfies in front of the Mona Lisa and post them on your Facebook page to show other people how wonderful your life is. That conspicuous consumption, basically spending money, buying things to impress other people. The research shows that's a dead end because hmm. there's no way to satisfy the need to impress other people because it's always someone who, who has a bigger or better something than what you have, whether it's a house or a car or the number of cars or shoes or expensive clothes or vacations. There's always someone you can compare. There's always someone you can socially compare yourself upwardly to that you think is doing better than you. And the research shows that not only is conspicuous consumption not conducive to well-being, but it actually detracts from it. That if your primary goal for making money is to impress other people with your stuff, then that actually is going to make you unhappier. As opposed to um, using money to further your education. Uh, using your money to to further your children's education, using money to donate to charity, using money to uh, pursue um, fulfilling hobbies, uh, using money for uh, for, uh, for reasons other than simply impressing other people. So money and well-being is complicated. And a lot of it is not not whether you want money, but what you want to do with the money you have and how you spend that money. So, so would, a, uh, would a useful question to ask yourself when, when purchasing something be, would I purchase this if no one were going to know about it? That, that's a oh. great question. I would say that's a great question to ask okay. yourself. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Am, am I buying this because I want, because I think I'll look good in this to other, am I buying this shirt because I think people will, will like this shirt or because, um, I would enjoy wearing this shirt around my house when there's no one. <laughs> like, if, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one, it, 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 um, if, if no one's going to yeah. see me in this, or uh, uh, that's that's I never have thought about it that way. But yes, that's uh. a great question to ask yourself, that, and, and that leads to the question of whether you are whether the, you are buying this in order to impress other people. Uh huh. Okay. So, it makes you feel good. Uh, my mind is going to my cupboard now because you brought the, the clothes thing up and I'm just wondering how much of my clothes are in one or the other category. It's, it's, it's actually like putting on a new lens. <laughs> yeah. It is, yeah. 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 Uh, and so it's something uh, to think about the next time you're tempted to buy one more shirt. <laughs> yes. Uh, or a different color of something. Or, or one more uh, pair of sneakers in a different color. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm definitely going to use that. I actually had the urge to buy some new clothes uh, recently, so I'm, I'm going to go with that lens and see what happens. It's going to be interesting. <laughs> Resist <the> urge. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> a, a book I read, I don't know, 25, 30 years ago, uh, called Your Money or Your Life. And the basic principle that I, one of the principles I took away from this is uh, the author says, the next time he says, okay, he says, okay, so um, you use your life energy to earn a living. <laughs> it's your time and your energy that goes into whatever you're paid per hour. You're using your time and your life energy to earn, whether it's $15 or $100, that's your life mm. energy. When you think about buying this $200 pair of sneakers, uh, ask yourself how many minutes or hours of my life energy did I expend uh, in order to buy these shoes? Are these shoes uh, worth two, five, six hours of my time and life energy? And, and usually the question is, well, no. 
<laughs> yes. So when, when you're tempted to buy more clothes, think about what mm-hmm. what you earn per hour and whether that shirt is worth, you know, a half hour or an hour or could maybe even 15 minutes. But um, yeah. usually it's worth, there's, there's often a, a um, an, an imbalance between um, what we think we are spending and what we are actually spending and how much of our time we spent in order to earn the money that we're going to spend on this $500, whatever, <laughs> freaking, yeah. whatever it is. <laughs> and you your eye that day. I think I, I'm I'm equipped with many questions now on my next <laughs> clothes trip. I'm either gonna make a very good decision for my well-being, or I'm gonna have an existential crisis in the in the clothes store. But <laughs> avoid going shopping. That's one of the best strategies. Ah, uh-huh. okay. Yeah. Shopping is great. Um, shopping when you need something. This all it also reminds me of. Um, uh, while we're on money, there's mm. good research showing that being in debt is very bad for well-being. And people often go into debt, as someone once mm. said, to buy things they don't want in order to impress people they don't ha- they don't like. <laughs> yes, U- using money I don't have to buy things I don't really want to impress people I don't really. Want. <laughs> yes, and yeah. Debt is a cause of stress, and of course, being stressed mm. is uh, not conducive to well-being. Uh, and people often go into mm. debt because of the desire to buy things, own things, do things, primarily to impress other people, mm-hmm. as opposed to for things and that they actually want and need. And and I've I've noticed a lot of this is um, like a keeping up with the Joneses sort of thing, or you know the the other person's yeah. doing this. And yeah. I I wanted to ask you why social upward social comparison is it seems to be very intuitive almost or like in instinctual in some way. Yeah, well, uh, you know I don't know what we go back to. Um, I don't know prehistoric times and the Neanderthals whether they were. You know, being one up on the other Neanderthals in the cave down in the cave down the street. Uh, it, it, it wouldn't surprise me if you know if you know if they did. But, but, and it, it might be. I'm not even sure. It's an interesting question of the cultural differences in the prevalence of conspicuous consumption and materialism in societies. I really don't know, but it's something worth investigating. I, I would assume because cultural differences uh-huh. seem so important in all kinds of things psychologically, uh-huh. uh, I would be surprised if there weren't cultural differences you know, across nations, across cultures, even within subcultures in a, in a, in a large country uh, regarding uh, conspicuous consumption. But yeah. you know, that the um, that the Swahili tribes in Africa are, yeah. are proud of their larger herds of cattle because um, it makes them feel important and rich. Um, no, I don't know. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. Instinctual, I don't know, uh, but mm. certainly um, uh, prevalent across uh, most cultures. I would assume, as well as assuming cultural differences. Mm, mm. Very, yeah, very interesting question to ponder, especially um, cross culturally. Yeah, uh, I've, uh, yeah, I, I, I see we're we're approaching uh, the end of our, our time, and ready. Yeah, I, uh, can you believe? <laughs> and uh, so, I've, I, I wanted to. Again, I'm, I'm giving you such broad questions because you've studied, right. you know, <laughs> you've researched so much of this and there's so much value. I mean, just in that book that you, you edited, it's, it's almost difficult not to be a stone skipping on the, uh, across the dam here. But, uh, I, th- I think my, my final broad question for you is for, for the people listening who, um, you know, they're looking to increase their, their well-being in some way. Is is there a hopeful, you know, I'll let them read your book or, you know, uh, listen to you a bit further to, to get more specific about the details, but is there any sort of general um, message that you would give them 
that that you as a scientist have learned over the years about increasing um, well-being like where does your hope come from Uh, well what sort of hopeful message can you leave them with I I guess the hopeful message is that uh, that people have more control than they often think they do Uh, not maybe not so much um, over what happens to them but how they respond to it for example I I guess a, a good place to start uh, or, or to finish is that uh, if, if you can partition the contributions to well-being into um, three factors, there's what happens to you that you have little control over, whether you're born in a poor family or a rich family, whether you're born in a democracy or dictatorship, whether you're born uh, uh, with, with a healthy body or with a disability. Uh, there's those things that happen to you. Uh, there is uh, a, a genetic component to the tendency to uh, be a happier person or a less happier person. And that's something you have no control over, but it's not an event. It's your DNA. And then there is um, how you interpret events, how you respond to them, uh, choices you make in life. And the research suggests that maybe 50% of your tendency to be a happier or unhappier person uh, is genetic, which means your genes put you in a a very broad spectrum of where you can move back and forth. The things that happen to you contribute maybe 10%. The other 40% is how you respond, how you react, how you think about things, how you interpret things, the choices you make. Um, and that 40% is the 40% people have control over. And that gives you a lot of room for, even if you are predisposed to be kind of a dreary, gloomy person who finds it difficult to uh, to, to to see positive things in life, you still can, with time and practice, make yourself a more optimistic person and enhance your well-being. So that, to me, is the hopeful message, is that people, I think, have a lot more control than they think they do, and that what happens to them, which people think, which I think a lot of people think, okay, these things happen to me, I can't control it. That may be true, but you can control how you respond, how you react, and what choices you make once those things have happened. To me, that's the optimistic message. <laughs> Great, yeah. That, that is very, I mean, I mean I've, I've felt that, um, you know, the, the power in, in those words, and that it, it, it gives me the sense that uh, regardless of what happens, there's always some way to turn up the dial on, on well-being. There's always some sort of wiggle room. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And it, but it takes practice to learn. Mm-hmm. How to yeah. Dr. Maddox, thank you so much for making time for this. My pleasure. Uh, it was fun. Very interesting. A lot of fun. Um, I'm glad. Yeah, I enjoyed the discussion. Uh, but where can people find out about uh, more about you and the work you do? Where? Uh, if they just Google mm. my name, I think my um, uh, personal website at George Mason pops up. It's, it's not very fancy. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's very simple, but, but, but if they go to my website, there'll be, I think, links to some publications. Um, the book's available on Amazon, I believe. Um, mm. So just, just Google me and see what comes up. <laughs>